Hey, I'm Luke. I'm one of the graduating seniors here. Welcome to Westby Online. Have you heard about Christmas in July? All kids who have completed kindergarten through fifth grade are invited to join us for a weekend VBS on Friday night, July 10th, and Saturday morning, July 11th. Space will be limited, so register soon at vbs.westby.org. As a church and a staff, we are especially grateful for your giving during the season, which is above and beyond anything we expected. This is a team effort and anything our church does and continues to do is possible because of your generosity. If you haven't tried it yet, check out online giving at give.westby.org. Thank you for joining us. Let's worship together. our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name of Jesus saints communion and in your holy church i believe in the resurrection when jesus comes again for i believe in the name of jesus i believe in god our father i believe in christ the son i believe
shall rise to thee holy 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons blessed Bunch of books in one book? It's a ton of different stories and books put together. Do you have a favorite verse? Yeah. Uh, hi. I'm so bad at memorizing verses. I forgot. I forgot all my verses. from the book, but sometimes they read it from their phones. I like Moses. Moses. When God speaks through the, the burning bush. Uh, Jesus. Of your neighbor. Mr. Jordan Richmond. <laughs> My dad. <laughs> the, the Bible is the number one best selling book of all time. It is also the most shoplifted book every year. What makes the Bible so special? We are beginning a new series today called We Believe, and we're covering several topics that make up our eight-part confessional statement at West Bradenton. We're beginning with the part of our confessional statement that talks about the Bible. Now, what is a confessional statement? That's a fancy phrase for just it just represents what the church believes. Every church should put out right out front, what they believe for people to know. There is no need to hide what we believe because it's the foundation of who we are as a congregation. That's why, we call, why we're calling this series, We Believe. Now, let me give you our statement, our confessional st part of our confessional statement that covers uh, the Bible, that covers what we call Scripture. Here's what it says. We believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old Testament and New Testament are the inerrant, inspired, an infallible word of God. God's word is the final authority for faith and life. Now, what does that word inerrant mean? It just means that the Bible is completely true. If God is perfect, then his word is perfect. When we say inspired, that the Bible is inspired, what does that word mean? It just means it's straight from God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, all scripture is inspired by God. Your translation may say, breathed out, breathed out by God. It's the same word in the Greek. God wrote the Bible through human personality. It comes from God, written by God, but through the human writers that we know today. In the same way that Jesus is fully human, fully God, so is his word fully human and fully God. Now, when we say that the Bible is infallible, what we mean by that is the Bible will never lead you astray. And it's the final authority, 
which means God's instructions are above everything else. Now, what exactly is the Bible? The Bible is God's revelation of himself to show us the way to hope. Romans 15.4 is a great verse. It's, it's, it's about scripture. Here's what it says. Here's what Paul writes in Romans. For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures. The reason we have the Bible is because it's God's roadmap to hope. The Bible is God's plan for redeeming his people. Yes, the story has ups and downs. There are failures and successes in the Bible. The Bible's not G-rated either. The characters are flawed. Every single character is flawed in the Bible, with one exception, Jesus Christ. Now, God reveals himself in creation. We, you can know that there's a God by looking at nature. Psalm 19.1 says this, that the heavens declare the glory of God and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Nature reveals a creator. Galileo knew this. Galileo was the great astronomer and father of the scientific method. He believed that God employed mathematics as the language of what he called the book of nature. Now, what this means is that science reveals a designer. We can know God generally through science and nature, but it is only through his word that we gain the insight that God wants us to know about him. Only through God's word can we know him specifically. You can see him generally in nature, but the Bible tells us how we can know God specifically. How does God want you to know him? That's only found in the Bible not nature. You know, when I look at, let me give you an example. When I look at something that has been designed, like a car or a painting, a building or a sculpture, I can claim it is designed. I can, I can look at those things and say, it's clearly designed. It didn't just happen. Someone put this together. Someone engineered it. Someone created it. So I can make that claim that a car is designed. But what I can't claim is that I know the designer. I can see that it has a designer, I just can't know who he is or who she is. So the, the, they, whoever the designer is, would have to reveal themselves to you in a relationship. You can't work, another way of thinking about this is you can't work your way into someone's heart any way you like. You can't love someone exclusively on your terms. They have to show you the way in. God has shown us a way in. Yes, he is revealed generally in nature. We can see that there's a designer, but to know him specifically, God has shown us a way in. That way is through the word Jesus Christ, the hope of salvation. God has shown us a way in through his word, the Bible. This is how we can know hope. Now, what is in the Bible? So that's what the Bible is. What is in the Bible? If you look at the, the table of contents in the Bible, you will see 66 books. There's 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, written by approximately 40 authors and covering about 1,600 years. There are multiple genres of literature in the Bible. You get law and history, poetry, narratives, letters. You even have apocalyptic literature in there. And why do we have so many translations? Um, I imagine that there's multiple translations of, that are used in our own church. Wh why so many? Well, there's several reasons why, but two big reasons are the, the words and the meanings of words change over time. So you'll have a word that 200 years ago meant something, and today it means something different. So the translation is constantly updating with what words mean today. So that's one reason why you have so many different translations and different translations over time. And th there are different purposes of translations. So some translations are word for word. They try to work that translation as exactly as they can. Other translations are thought for thought. Because the word for word translations are hard to read, they, they move them, the, the, some translators uh, translate thought for thought so that it's a little easier to read. And then some translations are paraphrased uh, specifically for things like devotional work. 
Um, so those are some reasons why you've got some different translations. Now, the process of writing the Bible began with Moses and the Ten Commandments. In fact, in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18, it says, when he finished speaking with Moses on, this is God, when he finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave him the two tablets of the testimony, stone tablets inspired, or inscribed, excuse me, by the finger of God. And as time progressed, more of God's word was added through the writing of scripture. We find this throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. In Joshua 24, it says that he wrote, Joshua wrote. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 30, the, the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah wrote. Jeremiah, another prophet, Jeremiah 30, Jeremiah wrote. In the New Testament, Jesus promised the disciples that the Holy Spirit would help them write the gospels, the letters, everything that became our Bible. So we know that people wrote the Bible as it was inspired by God. Now, why do we have the Bible? Now, this is an important question. It's one thing to know the contents. It's another thing to know why we have what we have. Here is the grand narrative of God. The Bible is the story of God redeeming his people. It begins with the voice of God giving shape to darkness. God creates a perfect garden, but there is a villain in this garden, a snake. Satan, the snake, wants to change God's narrative, to unmake God's good work. And Satan tells God's people that they can create their own story. They don't need to worry about God's story. They can create their own story, but this is a lie. You can't create your own story. God's people, through this lie, they, they almost become extinct. But an ark saves them. This ark foreshadows an even greater ark, one who would be able to save all, not just some. And God makes promises to his people. He promises that he will not destroy them. In fact, he will bless them. The people keep failing in their own story, and they become enslaved. And God once again saves and provides an exodus into a new promised land. God raises judges and kings, but even the best of them fall short. God then sends prophets to, to warn the people of their sins, that, that, that these sins that they have done trying to create their own narratives. And so there's warnings to them through prophets, but the people do not listen. Sometimes even the prophets themselves do not listen. There's a story of a great fish that points to a rescuer for all who run from God. And then God is silent for 400 years. Has God forgotten his promises? Will he ever speak again? What God does next is miraculous. The storyteller enters the story. He reaches the outcast and heals the sick. He teaches the masses and loves all people. But the snake wants to ruin the story. He plots and strikes back. The snake believes he derailed God's story and, and captured it for himself. But what has happened is actually the fulfillment of God's story. God saves his people. He frees his people, and then he sends them out as an army of storytellers. The Bible is a true story of God's incredible rescue, and the world needs to hear it. Why do we have the Bible? So we will share God's story, his story. How do we know the Bible's true, though? I mean, we say it is, but how do we know it's true? Well, one, the Bible itself claims this truth. Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is pure. Now, if you read your Bible and if you read it in the original languages, are you going to find bad grammar? Yes, the book of Mark. Mark was not a good writer. 
He wrote in terrible grammar. So yes, there's bad grammar in the Bible. Does the Bible contain approximations? Things like, hey, that's about a mile away. Sure, contains approximations. Will people interpret the Bible differently? Yes, we are fallible, so there will be, in different, there will be different interpretations. The Bible was also written in a particular context and is the product of that context. But none of those things make the Bible untrue. You can have bad grammar and still say something that's true, even if it's bad grammar. Uh, you can give an approximation about something and that's still true. Here's the bottom line. If God's word is false, then God has the capability of being false himself. If we accept that God is false, then we put ourselves in a place over God where we pick and choose our own truth. And that's the story of the Bible, that we can't do that. And if you are picking and choosing truth and what you believe to be true, how do you know that you will get it right? Are you perfect? You aren't. There must be something that is absolute, and that is God himself, that is Jesus, and that is his word. Now, what does Jesus think about the Bible? He actually tells us in John chapter 10, Jesus is in the middle of a toxic situation. It's in John chapter 10, he's near the end of his public ministry. It's winter, likely rainy. He goes into Solomon's colonnade and a group of people surround him and they just flat out ask him, are you God? And Jesus tells them, he says, I've been telling you this for three years and you don't believe. And in essence, he says, let me iterate, let me reiterate this one more time for you. I and the Father are one. He claims to be God. So what do these people do? They pick up rocks to stone him. And what does Jesus say? The scripture cannot be broken. A broken word is an untrue word. Jesus is not only claiming to be God, he's claiming to be the truth. Throw your rocks at God. You won't shake him. Throw your questions at scripture. You won't break it. If it's eternal, then unbreakable. If perfect, then incorruptible. And if complete, then indestructible. The word of God is unbreakable. The resurrection of Jesus proves it. Hi. Today we start a new series where we look closely at what we believe and why. Today we're talking about how we believe that God's word is true. The Bible is our guide for life. Let's talk about an example. Let's say I was gonna make a cake and I have my recipe card right here. You know how important it is to follow the directions when making a cake. Let's see, it says to put in flour. Uh, I don't wanna use flour. I think I'll use some potato chips instead. All right. Let's see, next it asks for oil. I don't have any oil, so I think I'll just use some Sprite. That'll work, right? It's close enough, it's liquid. All right, uh, you know what? Who needs the recipe card anyway? We can just do what we wanna do. We can make this cake exactly how we want it to be. So let's just see what sounds good. Um, ooh, do y'all like mustard? We'll add some mustard into our cake. That should be delicious. And then I don't have any sugar or anything, so this says onion powder. That should work. So a little onion powder in there. Mmm, smells delicious. And then, you know, I'm kind of out of ingredients. How about some hand sanitizer? Why not? It's around, and we've got plenty of it these days. So we'll add some hand sanitizer, and we'll stir it up. And do you want to eat this cake? I don't either. That's pretty disgusting. Because I decided to do it my way, instead of following the instructions. Friends, we often do that with God's word. We think we know better or we think we're smart enough to live life on our own. The Bible says all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable or good for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. That's from 2 Timothy 3.16. Because God's word is true, it is our ultimate instruction guide. When we choose to learn it and follow it, we grow closer to God and learn how he wants us to live and make less of a mess of our lives. 
kids.westby.org has daily devotions for you every single day. You can read more of God's Word. Go check it out.